Uh, good morning, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. This is the program on constitutional, constitutional government, and our guest today is Elliot Abrams. Elliot Abrams is a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he teaches uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Program for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown University, and his latest book is Tested by Zion, Zion <laughs> the Bush, Bush Administration and the Israeli Palestinian conflict and came out in 2013. Um, he's been in both the Reagan administration, where he was in the State Department, and in the George W. Bush administration, where he was in the White House. There he served as special assistant to the president in several posts. Uh, when he was promoted, um, we're going to perhaps have time, we hope, for uh, a, 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 a dissertation from him <laughs> on the uh, formalities of the White House, he went from special assistant to the president to deputy assistant, a much higher post. <laughs> and and, uh, now, and, and uh, he's also um, um, holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard and went to the Harvard Law School and graduated with success. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. So, I have a degree. so this is Elliot Abrams, and he's going to talk about President <laughs> Obama's Middle East policy. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey, for, um, for inviting me. Thank you all for, um, for being here. Um, the context for talking about Obama Middle East policy is a chaotic situation in the Middle East. Um, some people say it's the most chaotic situation <clears throat> since 1979, since the Islamic Republic was formed after the fall of the Shah, but I think one could argue it's the most chaotic situation since uh, World War I, since the days in which the Ottoman Empire fell apart and the new states which are now falling apart were actually uh, created. Um, <clears throat> and there are, there's a series of crises. Um, we're used to dealing with one at a time, <clears throat> a, um, you know, a war in Lebanon or uh, even in Iraq, but not crises in <clears throat> majority of the countries in the region, actually. Um, one change, <clears throat> therefore, today is that um, there, are, there are a series of crises. The other change I would suggest is, and we, here we get into the Obama question, um, <clears throat> since the Second World War, we largely, we the United States, largely were in charge of managing the problems that arose. Uh, the British began to decline after the end of the war, and um, particularly after they left Aden uh, in the 70s, and we took over um, until now, when we seem to want out. Remember that um, the president came to office believing um, and saying that he had a special insight to offer. And I want to read a few lines from his June 2009 Cairo speech. I'm a Christian, but my father came from a Kenyan family that includes generations of Muslims. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn and at the fall of dusk. As a young man, I worked in Chicago communities where many found dignity and peace in their Muslim faith. I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. That experience guides my conviction that partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't, and I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. This being the program on constitutional government, one might well ask where in the Constitution does that derive from, the, the responsibility to, um, to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear, but not negative stereotypes of Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the president, I mean, one mistake he made in that speech was addressing the world of Islam, uh, rather than Egypt and Indonesia and Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. The United States as a country really deals with other countries, not with <clears throat> Islam. Um, 
I would argue that, in fact, though this is a claim to special understanding, the president doesn't understand uh, the Middle East at all. I think the policy overall has had two parts. Uh, first, to seek a rapprochement with Iran. Uh, and second, to try to reduce the American presence in the region, and the two are uh, related. I think most regional experts, many anyway, would have suggested that uh, a policy that seeks a rapprochement with Iran and a reduction in the American presence uh, is likely to produce chaos, um, Iranian gains, violence, fear among our allies, and that is, in fact, what's happening. Um, let me talk about three developments. <clears throat> um, the Arab Spring, the uh, jihadi or millennialist Islamic movement, um, ISIS, al-Qaeda, um, and then the power surge of um, Iran. The Arab Spring, I think, um, which is now, what, four years old, was a series of revolts, uh, revolts against regimes, revolts for good and sufficient reasons in really every case. These were pretty rotten regimes, uh, Ben Ali in Tunisia, Mubarak in Egypt, uh, Assad. Um, in Tunisia, the revolt has led to democracy, and obviously we hope that proves to be stable. Um, in Libya and Yemen, uh, it has resulted in state failure. Um, in Syria, uh, state failure, then Iranian intervention, and massive, really almost incredible humanitarian um, crises. Um, millions, maybe eight million people <laughs> displaced from their homes. The UN now says 250,000 uh, killed. Um, and the refugee burden on Jordan and Lebanon is about a million to a million and a half each, quite a burden. Um, <clears throat> the result in Egypt, I would argue, we can talk about this later, was that an aging um, military dictator who took the title of president has now been replaced by a middle-aged uh, military dictator who has taken the title of president. <clears throat> um, the, the state failure has meant that, that national loyalties are being... Uh, challenged by other rival loyalties, tribal loyalties, religious loyalties, uh, family. Uh, tribes can be part of the solution as well as the problem. I think if, if, if as one tries to figure out how would you negotiate a, a peace agreement in Libya or Yemen, tribal loyalties are very strong and tribal leaders are going to have to be involved in that uh, negotiation. Um, there really is no state in either of those countries at the moment. Um, real trouble for the U.S. and American diplomacy because we're a state. We're used to dealing with states. We're not so used to dealing with tribes. Um, but as the states fail, non-state actors fill the void. Tribes are an example of this. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood in some places, uh, the army in some places, and the Islamic State in other places. Um, that's bad enough, but it's um, some of these particular non-state actors are motivated by religious extremism. Um, the president's continuing denial that the Islamic State, as it's called, has anything to do with Islam, I think, is let me, unhelpful. How's that for a, for a diplomatic term? I think it's actually ridiculous. It's ludicrous on its face. Uh, and makes it more difficult for us to understand the problem we're dealing with. Um, I do think that, that the, the growth of the Islamic State, or ISIS, <clears throat> is both an effect of and, and a cause of further state collapse. Similarly, for the use by Iran of Shia proxies in Shia militias in Iraq, Hezbollah, um, is both cause and effect of uh, state failure. The president's reaction to all of this has been basically to try to stay out. Um, in Egypt, um, we, got, we tried to get along fine with Mubarak and not, uh, not complain about him, though I think, it, I, again, we can go back to this, I think it was clear that that was an unstable regime. In fact, I would even argue that it was clear to Hosni Mubarak that it was an unstable regime. And we did notice that whenever in some Egyptian city of 
you know, 500,000 of which nobody in Washington had heard, there was a bread riot. Didn't even make the newspapers here. But Mubarak would take it very seriously and immediately order an increase in subsidies, lower the price of bread, and send in the army. And he took all of these seriously because I think he understood the fragility. Um, we didn't. Our, our policy was get along fine with Mubarak. So he gets overthrown. The army takes it. Get along fine with, the, fine with the army. Then President Morsi is elected and rules for a year. We get along fine with President Morsi and now with President Sisi. Just stay out of it. Likewise, in Syria, uh, you know, we, we had made a promise. There was a, there was a red line. Use chemical weapons, we'll do something. We will strike. Uh, he used chemical weapons. And by the way, he is doing it again. He is using chlorine gas, which is, after all, the, the definition of poison gas from World War I. Um, we're staying out. We're, we're not uh, doing anything. Um, the result of staying out has been to really shake up our allies, Arab and Israeli. They were used to depending on a kind of Pax Americana or, on occasion, a, let's call it a Bellum Americanum, to preserve themselves and stability in the region. Um, and they believe that our receding is opening a path for Iran to become the dominant regional power. So <clears throat> how did the Arabs react, the Sunnis? Um, they see themselves surrounded by increasing Iranian influence. There's a difference here because um, the Israelis are concerned first and foremost with the Iranian nuclear program and with Iranian expansionism second. The Sunni Arab governments, uh, it's the reverse. They are concerned primarily <clears throat> with the Iranian approach, the Iranian mindset, Iranian foreign policy, of, and they see the nuclear program as a subset of, Iranians, uh, of, of Iran's um, search for regional dominance. So we see the Saudi decision <clears throat> in the absence of, an American, of American leadership to try to provide Saudi leadership, to jump in themselves. <clears throat> we saw it first in Bahrain a couple of years ago when they sent troops and organized a regional force, got the Emiratis and others to send troops. Um, <clears throat> we now see it in Yemen at a much greater level. We see the Saudi Air Force engaged really for the first time um, in, uh, in fighting. Saudis and Emiratis, I think, are not going to wait to address this threat because they don't think we're, we're going to come through. They've lost faith in the U.S. And I would say that the question on the mind of, um, of many uh, Arab leaders, but also the Israelis, is whether this policy on the part of the president to back away is an anomaly or is a harbinger of a more isolationist American uh, foreign policy. <clears throat> the effort to have a new Arab force um, to which many Arab countries are now pledged, we'll see if anything eventuates, but um, is, I think, also <clears throat> part of this phenomenon. They don't believe the president's going to act, so they have to act. Um, <clears throat> the president's stated goal with respect to the Islamic State is to destroy it, which I think is the right goal. Um, but we're not going to be able to do it, in my view, because we don't have a Syria policy. We sort of have an Iraq policy, but I don't think you could even put in words what the Syria policy is. And the problem with that is that the situation in Syria, which has killed a quarter of a million people, is, I think, the machine that manufactures jihadis. Um, uh, the people being killed are largely Sunni. They're being killed by a regime that is viewed as Shia and that is supported by Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, and there are Iranian Revolutionary Guard troops in Syria, as there are obviously lots of thousands of, of Hezbollah people. Um, as long as that conflict is continuing and Sunnis are being killed in large numbers and by barrel bombs and other, by poison gas, it will be possible, I think, for um, the Islamic State to recruit Sunnis from all over. Um, and they'll have um, ungoverned space inside Iraq to use as a, uh, a safe haven and as a, as a base. Um, 
The decision to start fighting them in Iraq, the president's decision was, I think, the right decision. Because um, I think it's critical to stop the Islamic State's momentum. Uh, they have a narrative of success. In fact, they have a narrative of replicating the life of the prophet and the story of the prophet. Uh, <clears throat> success, momentum, conquest of more and more territory. We're doing it again now. So if we can turn that success story into a failure story, if we can stop the momentum, uh, I think that will hurt them a lot. Um, and candidly, um, one of the best ways of doing that is um, to kill them. I mean, there isn't going to be com the, the, the ideological concept. Uh, this is an ideological war combating violent extremism. I think that's all right. But you're not going to succeed with that either unless you are stopping their battlefield momentum. And that's a military task. Um, the policy in Iraq, I can explain, I think. Um, they sort of have a government, so we're going to work with that government and help it. They have an army, sort of, so we can help improve the army. Um, and we help the Kurds. So we're, we're, we're trying to help the Peshmerga, uh, which is a very good thing to do, improve. We're trying to work with the Sunni uh, tribal groups with whom we worked during the surge and whom we then pretty much abandoned, trying to get them to trust us again, try to build up the Iraqi army. Um, that's the part of it I like. The other part of it that I don't like is the party that we, excuse me, the policy that we don't uh, really state, which is to rely on Iran largely to address the problem of ISIS in uh, Iraq and to cooperate with Iran. I think it's a little strong to say we're serving as the Iranian troops' air force, but um, we're cooperating. And the problem with this is it, it um, won't get you very far with Sunnis in Iraq, and it terrifies our other allies in the region, primarily Arab allies, um, it does allow the president to try to address the problem of the Islamic State, uh, let's say, more cheaply, because the troops on the ground are Iranian proxies, mostly Shia militias. Um, I think the numbers are, you know, people are guessing, but roughly 50,000 people in the Iraqi army, but 100,000 in these Iranian-backed Shia militias. Um, you have, you need fewer Americans on the scene, which obviously the president wants, A. B, I think he also likes it because it is part of the overall policy of rapprochement with Iran. See, we're working together in Iraq. We can work together in lots of, um, of different places. Um, that's bad enough. For Syria, I, don't, I just don't think we have a policy at all, um, except stay out. Don't do anything. Um, in the administration's view, there is this horrible, brutal Assad regime, but the groups fighting it are equally distasteful, so we're not for us. Um, and who is fighting in Syria? Well, Iran is. Iran um, has uh, certainly advisors, maybe some IRGC troops on the ground in Syria, and of course it has sent Hezbollah in to not just advise, to fight. Um, in Syria, and lots of guns and lots of, of money. Um, and I think the administration doesn't want to fight Iran in Syria again, because that undermines the overall policy of rapprochement with, with Iran. Um, and Iran really does care about Syria. It seems to care more than we do. It's their critical, um, it has been their critical Arab asset. They seem now to be pretty dominant in Iraq, but Syria came first. It gives them a land bridge, in a sense, to Hezbollah, and it gives them a border with Israel. Um, they want to be in control of Syria more than President Obama uh, wants to resist their control of Syria. Um, there's a real problem here for the whole region, which is that um, when we send any signal that we view Iran as a partner in any of this, um, we lose more and more Sunni allies and potential allies, because to them, the Islamic State is a threat, 
that has to be dealt with, that has to be fought. But Iran is a greater threat. They view Iran, Persia, the Shia as a greater long-term threat. Um, the Saudis, for example, cannot afford to allow the Islamic State to portray itself as the protector of Sunnis. I mean, that's their job. The king's title, you know, is not king. It's custodian of the two holy mosques. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't allow, the, can't allow the Islamic State to replace your authenticity here. Um, we, of course, come across as a pretty unreliable ally to most of our allies in the region. <clears throat> we appear to be uh, either afraid of Iran or actually pro-Shia or seeking a kind of overall regional settlement with Iran that will leave it as the greatest Muslim power. And that is obviously unacceptable to our Sunni friends in the region. Um, a word about Israel. Um, they worry, when I talk to Israelis and Sunni Arabs, um, you might say that they have two, they share two big concerns. One is Iran and the other is us, uh, America. Uh, are we a reliable ally? What's going on in Washington? Um, how, who's going to be president and, and uh, what are the isolationist um, tendencies in the American population? Uh, like the Sunnis, the Israelis wonder if they have an Obama problem or they have um, a deeper problem with the United States. They see the kind of, the Israelis see the level of hostility to Israel as an Obama problem um, caused by the usual left-right frictions. I mean, <clears throat> remember, Israel's had uh, right-wing governments for 15 years now, so it's not surprising there's a bit of friction with the American uh, left. Obviously, they understand there's a real discord over Iran policy. There are personality difficulties here. Um, but they also think the, the president just doesn't have a, much of a commitment to, um, to Israel. I would say one of the, one of the effects of the Israeli um, view of the, of, the, of the regional scene, which is of states collapsing all over the place and Iran rising as a danger, is that um, it's hard to find an Israeli who thinks this is a Jim Dandy moment to create a Palestinian state. Um, because, uh, obviously, because of the um, the danger that this would not be a stable state, that it could not provide security for itself or Jordan um, or Israel. Um, I should say something about um, the Iranian nuclear question. Obviously, we can talk about that, but <clears throat> I am reminded of this important sentence in the Schultz-Kissinger op-ed a couple of days ago. Negotiations to prevent an Iranian capability to develop a nuclear arsenal are ending with an agreement that concedes this very capability. I think that sums it up. I mean, when the administration began six and almost six and a half years ago, the idea was <clears throat> we're saying no to a lot of Iran's nuclear program. They've got to stop. Um, and we're now negotiating what amounts to containment. Yes, they're going to have a nuclear program. They're going to be a threshold power. Um, they're going to be a legitimate threshold power. Um, why is this? Well, the Iranians said, no. We said, you may not do this. And they said, no, we want to do this. And we then said, oh, OK. They wanted it more than we wanted to stop it. There were other options, including a significant increase in sanctions. But we, uh, we changed our policy, really, to one of um, containment, and we don't we, we measure the success of this now in this breakout idea of a year. Um, sufficient time to respond if Iran flouts the deal and does pursue the nuclear weapons. So they keep their nuclear infrastructure under inspection. Um, I think this is a bad deal. For one thing, it gives them a great deal more economic resources with which to pursue a um, disruptive and, and really nefarious foreign policy. <clears throat> the one-year rule, I think, is impossible. I mean, it, it requires an inspection regime that has never been seen, um, except when countries really didn't want a nuclear weapon. 
And we now have uh, no less a figure than the Supreme Leader himself telling us, what, an inspection regime? Uh, military sites are off limits. You can't do that. And we're not going to have any inspection regime that everybody else has. Nothing special for Iran. So, I mean, it does raise the question of whether there was, to use the lawyer's expression for a contract, a meeting of the minds in Lausanne. History suggests they're going to sneak and they're going to cheat. Um, and actually, you know, if you or I were in their shoes, we would too, in the sense that we would certainly wish to test what the Americans will do if you move right to the line and then you move over the line. That would be an intelligent thing for them to do, so they'll do it. And what are we going to do in that, in that uh, situation? I mean, they have been cheating. Look at the question of the uh, PMDs, previous military, the, the military dimension, the, that is to say warhead work. And the IAEA has said repeatedly in report after report, we have evidence they've been working on warheads and we need to find out more. And the Iranians have said no. And they are continuing to say no. Uh, and it doesn't seem to matter. And we just continue to negotiate a deal with them. Um, <clears throat> So we have, a, we have uh, the president explaining a couple of days ago that um, uh, this will work, uh, though it will sunset after 10 or 12 or 13 years, and then they may be weeks away from a bomb, which is a remarkable thing to say to the, to the neighbor states, including uh, to Israel, that, you know, I've got you 10 years, that I hope that's good enough, and then at the end of it they get a nuclear weapon. Um, it's, not, it's not good enough, and I would argue that <clears throat> what our policy should be is to make clear to the Iranians, and I, I think this would have been a nice thing to do a few years ago, at the beginning of the negotiation, um, you're never going to get a nuclear weapon. You are never going to get a nuclear weapon. We will do what it takes to stop you. And the day you announce that you've got a nuclear weapon, that's the day we will end your possession of a nuclear weapon. This will never, never happen. So everything that you're doing and the billions that you're spending and the pariah state status that you've achieved and the boycotts and the sanctions for nothing because you will never get a nuclear weapon. I think if they believed that, you might be able to negotiate a good deal, but obviously they, they don't believe it. Um, how, to, how to end? Um, I think overall the president has replaced power and the uses of power at the center of American foreign policy with a policy of um, engagement with our enemies, of denigrating the utility of allies, because what do you need allies for? If you want to engage with your enemies, allies are just people who get you in trouble. You know, Poles and Czechs who are, who are there near Russia, and, and, and Filipinos and Japanese and Vietnamese who might get you in trouble with China. Um, they're just going to drag you into conflict. So who needs that? Um, and they know this. I mean, if you talk to the people, to the leaders of countries near Russia or the leaders of countries near China or the leaders of countries near Iran, you hear the same thing, basically, which is, where are you guys? We thought we had a kind of um, alliance here. Um, I think this emerges essentially from the president's um, I took GOV 180 as a, I think, sophomore, so I can say Weltanschauung, um, which is basically to blame the United States for the problems we see in world politics. Um, the less we do, the better. We got to change Cuba policy because the isolation of Cuba is our fault, not Castro's. We need to change Iran policy because we overthrew Mossadegh, which, by the way, I think the British did. But um, American power causes problems, doesn't solve them, so the less power, the better. Thus, the cuts in the military budget are not only okay, they're probably a good thing from this point of view. I think that um, this is a big mistake, which I hope the next president will reverse. Uh, for one thing, I think we will need to get back to being able to convey the view that it is advantageous to be an ally of the United States and disadvantageous to be um, an enemy of the United States. A, fundamental principle of world politics that I think we are uh, dispensing with um, dangerously.
Thank you, Elliot. Well, and so now we have questions. My first question is, uh, Gov 180, was that uh, Henry Kissinger or George Bundy? That was Kissinger. Kissinger, okay. That was Kissinger. In my day. Right. <laughs> you, so you spoke up first, Martha. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if, if, if Obama's uh, goal, uh, as you suggest, uh, were simply to back away, and I think you used the words back away mm -hmm. uh, from the Middle East, that might be defensible. But his muscular uh, push to treat with Iran belies any simple disengagement, does it not? What's the, what would you say the source of his seeming uh, solicitude is for Iran? Thank you. I think it is this general view that um, <clears throat> in the case of Cuba and the case of Iran and in other cases historically, we are at fault. We have created these bad situations, and the continuation of them is a stupid manifestation of the refusal to confront our past. Um, we, we, um, why do we not have a better relationship with Cuba? Why do we not have a better relationship with Iran? We can do it. Uh, we can reach out. And of course, this has failed. This was also tried with the Russia reset. I think the president would acknowledge it failed in the case of Putin. Um, but I think it's part, really is part, of, of a worldview that these are old, stale conflicts that were produced by American misconduct. And so we need now to, um, I mean, when he talks about this, he doesn't talk about, for example, he doesn't say, you know, this all started with the hostage crisis. We had relations with the new government of Iran after they overthrew the Shah until the, they seized the embassy. No, no, no. It starts with Mossadegh. So I think that's, that's the pardon the expression, narrative that he believes. Henri. You, you've made this that it's a problem with Obama, which implies that when he goes, there's an opportunity for policy change. And the question is, I suppose, what should we do? I can recall that Iran and Iraq fought each other for eight years. And six years into it, if I had asked somebody, are Iran and Iraq still fighting? Nobody knew. And the reason was that as they were fighting each other, they left the rest of the world alone. We have this, this historical enmity between Shiites and Sunnis. I don't pretend to understand. I'm not even sure sometimes I can identify which is on which side. But does it make sense in some fundamental way to simply encourage the two of them to go at each other? Uh, in effect, you know, I'll be a little bit flip. Supply arms to both sides, let them kill until there's one man standing, shoot him and put up a mall. <laughs> uh, uh, is that a, you know, instead of... A Rand Paul voter. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rand Paul, I think, would just say stay out of the whole thing. But does it make sense, perhaps, instead of we find ourselves in this awkward situation where we're with Iran in one place, we're against Iran in another, and it's precisely because of this. Can we step aside and just let those two go at it, understanding that every once in a while we will have a terrorist event here, but that's you know, sort of like automobile accidents or murders. It's part of modern living, and we can survive it. I realize it's a bit cynical, but I think you get the flavor of where, uh, where I'm headed. I can certainly see the um, attraction of saying, you know, say, take Yemen. You know, very few Americans care a lot about Yemen, and it's complicated, and it's Sunni Shia, and it's tribal, and it's the Saudi influence, and, um, but, but um, then there's another side to the argument. Um, go to the south of Yemen, and now we're talking about access to the Suez Canal. Do we really want three, million, three and a half million barrels a day of oil to go through the, the strait, the Bab el Mandeb? Do we really want that to be under either Iranian or ISIS control? We have always prevented control of the Persian Gulf by Iran, which I think would probably be um, would eventuate if we were to withdraw the U.S. Navy. Do we care? Well, you know, we ought to care. I mean, it, it has an economic impact. Then there's the question of terrorism, and I guess I'm less sanguine than you are. <coughs> um, 
I think American opinion changed a lot after the beheadings because people saw on TV, first of all, those were Americans being killed, and secondly, this is unbelievably brutal and savage, and it really does deserve the term medieval. So we watched ISIS um, expand to the usual phrases, you know, an uh, area the size of Great Britain. I don't know, does Great Britain go to Scotland now? Or we have to, we have to ask about these things, but um, big, big area. Um, and it could have been bigger. Maybe it would have been most of Syria, half of Iraq. Um, do we care about this? Well, this is an awfully large safe area from which to launch uh, terrorist attacks. And I, I'm not, I, I don't think many Americans would take the view that it's like traffic accidents when somebody blows up a mall uh, or takes down the World Trade Center. That's 3,000 at a time. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't think that would be a good policy. I think the question is, well, yeah, but sending 100,000 troops to Yemen is not a good policy either, so what do you do? Um, and here we do have the, the Arab states willing to do something. So we should be very supportive of them, I think, and not give the impression that we think the Iranian um, intervention might be a good thing. Um, and it is true that Iran is fighting ISIS because they're Sunnis. Um, but meanwhile, you know, so they build up Shia militias of 100,000 in, in Iraq. They're really in control of the country except for Kurdistan. And, you know, once upon a time, Saddam Hussein wanted to take over Kuwait, and we stopped it partly because that would have been Iraq, Kuwait together, too much of the world's oil supply in his hands. If you add Iran and Iraq together, that's a very big piece of the world's oil supplies. And uh, I, I, again, I wonder, you know, you can say, well, what do you care? You have North American energy independence now. Um, well, we do care. That we, there, there's a global oil price. So I think you wouldn't get very many votes for sending, for having another Iraq war too. But I'm, I don't think it's hard to make the argument that the consolidation of control of gigantic resources by these terrorist groups must be prevented. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, just sort of a follow-up question. Uh, one can readily understand why Americans would be mixed or indifferent about the Iraq-Iran war uh, or about what's going on in Yemen. Uh, even to some degree, uh, Syria. But suppose uh, there flares up within the next six months to a year a uh, <coughs> war situation between Saudi Arabia <coughs> and uh, Iran, which strikes me as not inconceivable. What would you think would be the American response <coughs> to such a situation? <coughs> Once upon a time, I would say under President Clinton or President Bush, either President Bush, I think the answer would have been pretty clear, which is that we would have helped the Saudis defend themselves and win, um, have to define win. But um, I w I'm not 100% sure. I would hope that is still true. Um, if it isn't true, then we have no alliance structures around the world. Um, so I would hope that the president would, I'm not suggesting that, again, that we send an expeditionary force um, of hundreds of thousands of men, as we did twice before. But um, on the other hand, uh, you know, the population of Iran is twice that of Saudi Arabia, 30 million, 70 million. Um, if we thought that Iran was really making an effort to seize the eastern province, which is where the oil is and where the Shia are, and maybe, maybe seize for Shia Islam Mecca and Medina, take over the country. Um, I would say we need to fight to prevent that with all that it implies for the region, with all that it implies for <coughs> oil supplies and our economy. I would say we, we, we could not permit that to happen. Now, would that be the president's view? I don't know. I, I would just tell you, um, 
for the president's um, first term. Remember, all options are on the table about Iran. I had friends in the administration who would say to me, you're, you're, don't discount this president. He's no pacifist. And when he says all options are on the table to stop an Iranian nuclear weapon, he means it. Then came the Syria red line. And my friends in the administration, when I asked them, do you still believe, would all say, well, so I, I don't know. Well, you know, uh, Obama's answer is, uh, we don't want to go to war, and the American people don't want to go to war. Uh, there's a certain strength in that, isn't there? Uh, uh, um, yes. we're, we're the sole superpower in the world, and that, that, it would seem that uh, along with that goes the duty of maintaining some kind of order, and along with that goes the reality that uh, we'll occasionally have to fight, and maybe along with that occasionally gets expanded into nearly always either uh, fighting or threatening to fight. Is, is that a kind of uh, policy that our country mm. <laughs> is capable of uh, pursuing? Well, um, you know, my, I have a firm answer, which is I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What, what's not, what we're not capable of, I think, is having a, a continual series of gigantic wars, or uh, gigantic, it's not World War II, but, you know, of having, of having um, uh, the, the Gulf War II followed a year later by, you know, another 500,000 men fighting someplace else, yeah. and then another war, and then another war. I don't think that would be tolerated. Um, but I do think there is a sense, uh, maybe this is wrong, I do think there is a sense in the country uh, that this is, we want to be, to use the British phrase, top country. And it's important that we have that role and that we, we exercise it to maintain a certain degree of order in the world. Now, how do you do that? I mean, here's an example. I, I'll, I'll take uh, uh, Professor Keller's example. Um, if something starts between Iran and Saudi Arabia, um, we could say to the Iranians, for example, um, this must stop now, or on behalf of our Saudi allies, we will destroy Karg Island, which is the place from which their oil is exported. And you will not export oil for 20 years. <laughs> or we will destroy this, or we will destroy that. We could do that in airstrikes. And Iran has no ability to strike the United States, so it would be a credible threat. This is why I thought the failure to do what we had, had said we would do in Syria. I mean, here's a good example. When you ask people in the administration, why didn't the president go ahead and strike the Syrian um, chemical weapons facilities or their whole air force, the answer is there was no public support. And that's true. In this, if you look at the polls, it was sort of 80-20 uh, against it. Um, but I remember being in a discussion uh, of, uh, of this in Washington, and, a, and, a, and someone from the Clinton administration said, you had 20% support. When Clinton went into the Balkans, he had about 8 or 9% support. But he believed he could explain it to the American people and that we needed to do it. I believe that if the president had done it and gone on TV the next day and said, we're not going to leave our children a world where poison gas is once again used all the time, and We'd, and, and it's over. The airstrikes are over. Um, I think there would have been 90% support. So in this context, I think you can go on TV and say, we're not going to let Iran start picking off all the neighboring countries to control the world's whole oil supply. First its own, then Iraq's, then Saudi Arabia's. What's next? Then Bahrain will be next. Um, we're not going to pr permit that. We're not sending an army over there, but we're going to. I think you would get support, I think. Mm -hmm. Is, is it possible to revive what used to be called gunboat diplomacy? Being ready to, to make uh, small efforts um, um, which, are, which will uh, be, be recognized. Uh, I would think the answer to that is yes. I mean, the, it's interesting, the Egyptians have sent gunboats off the coast of, of uh, Yemen now. Um, gunboat diplomacy was particularly useful when there was a discrepancy in power. 
<laughs> and I mean, with all due respect to the Iranians, it is a country of 70 million people. It's not really in the league with the United States. So one would think, um, I mean, our gunboat, where do we have gunboat diplomacy? In Persian Gulf, above all. Um, and uh, it works. Peter. Yes, Elliot. Um, I wanted to direct your attention back toward the um, Iran deal and ask you what you think um, can be done or what ought to be done at this point. I, I guess in what I have in mind is that in the Kissinger and Schultz piece in the, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, um, even they seem to accept the argument that when it comes to maintaining any kind of sanction regime, we're going to be on our own and our allies aren't going to be with us. I assume that's either because they see us as feckless or because they have their own economic interests. Um, um, what, 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 how do you see it? What, 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 what is to be done at this point? Well, it's very hard. <clears throat> I think the, the sanctions could have been maintained, could have been increased. If we'd stuck with the position, they can't have a nuclear infrastructure, which was the going in position. And it was with that position that we got this sanctions regime. We got the international cooperation around the idea they can't do this. Then we started saying, well, maybe. Um, so of course, the people who want to do business with Iran are you know, happy to accept that lesser position. Well, one thing we could do now, um, boy, I think the president's mishandling this. Uh, now, I mean, take, take the agreement as written. Um, I'm very struck that the Iranians, starting with the Supreme Leader, but also Rouhani, are saying, uh, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that, and this doesn't mean X, and that doesn't mean Y. And now maybe it's because the Supreme Leader doesn't want to do this deal. Possible. But it's a wonderfully intelligent negotiating stance. So when Zarif comes back to the table with Kerry, he'll say, oh, I can't, I can't do this, and I can't do that. Meanwhile, the president's taking victory laps that show the Iranians he must have this deal. It is his only foreign policy achievement. Uh, likewise, Kerry. So when they go back to the table, they're in a weak negotiating position. This is not smart as a matter of sort of elementary negotiating tactics. We're, so we're not, we're not helping ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'd like to see Congress pass legislation. I would actually like to see Congress strengthen the ballistic missile, human rights, and terrorism sanctions. Um, people say the Iranians would view that as a killer. Uh, I'm not so sure. Not if they really want this deal. If they want this deal. I'd like to see us uh, set forth more clearly a really tough line on cheating. Um, I don't really believe the snapback provisions can work. It would be a real change in the way the UN does business. And it would, it is said that the Chinese and Russians aren't happy because it undermines the value of a veto, uh, or it does undermine the value of a veto, so I'm not so sure they'll accept it. Uh, but I'd like to see us establish a kind of regimen. Uh, on the question of whether the sanctions could be put back together, you know, let's say three years from now, if everybody, uh, not just the Indians and the Chinese and the Russians, but, you know, Siemens and Renault are really in business in Iran, they're not going to want to stop. The best we can do, I think, is to make people choose between b doing business here and there. It's the secondary sanctions. It's pretty powerful. It wouldn't work with Renault. They don't sell much here. Um, but for a company like Siemens or, or um, uh, Volkswagen or something like that, or European banks, you know, forcing them to choose between us and Iran um, ought to work. Um, I, I wouldn't. Uh, this deal seems to be so flawed mm -hmm. that I think we would be better off if they could not actually turn it into a deal and had to start renegotiating. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to go back to the question that was raised about this dichotomy that Obama set up in this free Thomas Friedman interview that the choices between this deal with all of its complexities or weaknesses, critics would say, and war. Um, the pushback from, say, Benjamin Netanyahu and others is the alternative is there's two other alternatives. One would be a better deal, and the other would be strengthening the sanctions, maybe in order to get a better deal. Um, 
there's something to that, but I'm inclined to actually agree with Obama, although I don't think the alternative is, is the deal or war today, maybe the deal or war in the next five to ten years. Um, and I guess my question is, is there really, you know, you identified yourself as the most persuasive manner of containing the Iranian regime's nuclear weapons program as its fear of a military strike, which has to be about zero, at least of the Obama administration now, although the Israelis probably not, not zero, but low. Um, and so I kind of wonder whether the sanctions aren't a kind of sideshow. Of course, they're damaging to the Iranian regime's economy, and the Iranians would like to exploit the Obama administration's appeasement instincts to get them lifted. But I don't see any reason to believe that heightening sanctions would block the Iranian regime's getting nuclear weapons, their desire to, or even their ability. And it seems in a certain sense they're a sideshow. So, I, I mean, it, is it really perhaps more reasonable to consider the issue of a strike, which won't happen until another president is in office? I mean, Ehud Barak was on television a couple days ago saying, well, look, it's not between, uh, you know, this deal and another, like, Iraq-style, Iraq War II-style war. It's between this deal and a kind of, he said it would be closer to the Ob uh, Osama bin Laden raid than to mm. the Iraq War. Maybe not, it would be more complex and larger. So maybe one should, you know, this this has to be considered because in a way I think the American people are terrified of another large ground war, yeah. and that's what they're being told the alternative is, where it seems no military planner actually thinks that. Well, first, um, I think the administration's been very disingenuous here because for six years we've been told no deal is better than a bad deal. No deal is better than a bad deal. Now if you raise your hand and say, I think this is a bad deal, they say, ah, you want war. You're a warmonger. Whatever happened to the narrative, which was the Obama narrative, we're going to use sanctions, and all options are on the table, and we're going to get them to take apart this, this program. Um, now, all of a sudden, if that's your view, you're a warmonger. This is not a fair uh, means of arguing. Um, now, um, you know, it's possible. Uh, th I think that the, the argument that, that you stated is right. Um, that in the end, sanctions would have failed, uh, even heightened sanctions. One cannot be sure. Um, clearly, there is some pressure on the government to, uh, government of Iran to, to improve the economy. How much, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's not North Korea. People are not starving. Um, one the European said to me, um, it's like this. Um, for a while, Iranian middle class, upper middle class Iranians were able to go to, say, Turkey on vacation. Well, they can't do that now. They, they don't have enough money, so they have to vacation within the country. This is not a pre-revolutionary situation. Um, but uh, Rouhani was elected, you know, uh, saying he'd fix the economy. And um, if the sanctions had been tightened, maybe we could have squeezed the nuclear program more. Um, Maybe we could have persuaded them, or they could have persuaded themselves. Um, we need to really shelve this program. It's not that we, we won't get a bomb for 10 or 12 years. We need to shelve the program for 10 years and really develop the economy. And then we'll come back to it. Um, but we didn't push hard enough for them to get that. Um, I think that the combination of increasing sanctions, remember they kept rising and the fear of a strike um, had a real impact. Now, I think today they don't have any fear of us, and they don't have much fear of the Israelis. They're, they seem to be moving toward a strike in the summer of 2012, and they didn't do it. And I think after that, the Iranians came to believe it's not going to happen. Um, I, I do believe that um, we could convince them, another president could convince them, um, I mean, I am struck by this. Uh, their policy has been one of very slow, though steady, advancement. No leaps. Why not? I think because they feared that a leap would cause an American or Israeli strike. So it's not zero credibility. Um, they want to avoid, if you will, cornering the Israelis or, or the Americans. Now, what would a strike, I, I agree with what uh, you said or you quoted about a strike. You know, we are not talking about World War III here. If you ask yourself, what would the Iranians do? I don't think their options the day after are very good. 
uh, the day after an American strike. Um, what are they going to do? They have no real way of uh, attacking the United States. Um, yes, they could engage in acts of terror. They already do engage in acts of terror. Barack said they would attack Israel. That was the only thing. Well, they do. You know, they, they don't really have very many good ways, other than Hezbollah, which is a very good way. Uh, but directly, they don't have very many good ways of attacking Israel either. Um, so uh, I don't want to be cavalier about this, but I think that the the argument that that's a step toward World War III, it's going to be like the Iraq War, is, is, um, is never explained. And, and I don't think it's persuasive. Dustin. Uh, besides uh, destabilizing, destabilizing you know, Iraq and the, the wider region, it seems like the Iraq War was ultimately kind of wind in the sails of Obama's America's at fault narrative. Um, and it seems to really underlie a lot of the, um, the willingness to, to not intervene now when intervention abroad would really make a lot of sense. So I'm just wondering, how big of a mistake do you think the Iraq War was? I don't know. That's a very hard <laughs> question. That's a very hard question. Um, it requires you, for one thing, to distinguish the decision to go to war and the handling of the post-war situation, which I think can be distinguished. But now we're talking counterfactuals, and how do you prove that a different policy would have avoided a lot of the trouble? Um, and then you have to look at the question of, well, what if we hadn't done anything? You know that the sanctions regime was fraying, and so was the no-fly zone. Um, and uh, uh, we know now that Saddam had no nuclear program uh, but he might have had a nuclear program five years later uh, as the pressure diminished. So what would the Middle East have looked like uh, with Saddam Hussein, with that un really unbelievably evil regime in the middle of it? Um, it's, it's a very hard series of, of um, decision trees and counterfactuals to, to put together. I guess where I come down is I think the, the decision to invade, given what we knew then, um, was correct, and the handling of the post-invasion situation was terrible. And, and uh, the kind of collapse didn't have to happen. Yes. Anne Pierce. Um, since the Iraq War, many Americans seem to have succumbed to the either-or idea that either we avoid active involvement in the Middle East or we'll end up with boots on the ground. And yet, in World War II, if we learned anything, I think it was that if we're passive as atrocities and hostilities escalate, we're more likely to be forced into war by events spiraling out of control. And um, one thing I've been writing about, really concerned about lately, is that as much as it makes us feel like we're doing something in reaction to hostilities and atrocities now by fighting ISIS is that the way we're fighting ISIS is enabling Iran and Syria and Russia. And so I'm concerned that there's still a sense of complacency as mm. things really are, in Chuck Hagel's words, exploding all over. And I just wondered how severe you see the situation as being and if you agree with that, that we are in the way we're fighting ISIS, really handing Russia and Iran and Syria just what they need. I'm basically sympathetic um, with that view. Uh, I think um, we, ISIS would not have uh, metastasized this way had the president um, acted more quickly in Syria. And um, on this question of, you know, what would a different president do, Remember that that was um, quite a personal decision. Uh, CIA Director Petraeus and De Defense Secretary Panetta and Secretary of State Clinton all urged him to do a lot more in Syria, and he refused. So it isn't even a left-right Democratic-Republican thing. Um, he did not take the advice of the senior officials in his own um, administration, two of whom had been elected Democratic officials, Panetta and, and Clinton. Um, so I, th I think um, we are feeding this 
in many ways, we're feeding the disorder and we're feeding the Iranian, particularly the Iranian um, expansion. Uh, obviously, Putin's situation is, is different, but it is striking to me that, um, you know, what price has he paid for what he's done in, in Ukraine? Um, not much. It's not zero. There are sanctions. Um, but they don't seem to be killing him. And, um, you know, the, the feeling on the part of, of our allies in that region is one of fear. I mean, in the, the NATO, even the NATO member countries wonder what's NATO worth and will NATO come to our defense, uh, something that, you know, they haven't felt in a very long time. So I think this is um, dangerous. And the next president, Democrat or Republican, is going to be faced with a very difficult task in reasserting American power. And the way to do that is, you know, is not to sort of look around and say, well, let's have a big war uh, and let's send half a million troops and that'll show people. Figuring out how to demonstrate renewed resolve um, is going to be hard, although one piece of it I think is very clear, and that is we must stop the decline in the defense budget and the decline in our, in our military capabilities. That's significant. Um, and then, you know, we'll have to see what opportunities arise to, uh, to show that policy has changed. And opportunities, you know, can't be predicted. Um, the example that people use of Reagan, I think, is, can be overstated, but it's right. When Reagan fired the air traffic controllers, it was just a few months into his administration, it did have a foreign policy impact. It did tell uh, foreign governments there was a new guy here, and he seemed to be willing to keep his promises um, and looked pretty tough. And that, I think that had a real impact. And remember, this is 1980-81 we're talking about, um, after the Carter administration, and people were saying, um, you know, it'll take two generations or a generation to, o to, to, to overcome uh, Vietnam. Well, it didn't. Oh, Martha. Just one, one. You, you talk about the next president. Um, I can see you're something of an optimist, the way you keep referring to the next president. Um, I'm sure, I guess I sort of have a question about the domestic politics of U.S. foreign policy at this point. You, you alluded earlier to the fact that Clinton had 8% support for going into the Balkans, but we were going in there on a basically on a humanitarian basis. And when he, when he went on television being Clinton, and given the reason, it was not that difficult to explain it. Um, but in the Middle East these days, it seems like we're playing the part of another, um, another kind of tribe or another uh, segment of, the, of that ever-shifting landscape, and we're shifting our loyalties around much as they do, only with less skill. Um, and how do you tell the American people who tend to think of foreign policy as a good guys versus bad guys thing, and back also in the days of the Balkans, we haven't had uh, the wars that we have now had, and the weariness that has set in about that, and the cynicism. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of domestic political support for the good ideas that you're setting forth, or at least the, the reparation work that you're recommending, um, have you, do you have any wisdom to share on, on sort of that narrative? Yeah, uh, these are very, you know, these are very hard questions, and the answer has to be speculation. Um, I do think that um, people will respond both to a humanitarian appeal and to a power-based appeal. Um, I think, for example, um, as I said, bomb, having, having bombed Syria would have been essentially humanitarian. It's, they're not gassing us, but they're gassing somebody. This is not permissible. We're, we're not there. We're not going to permit it because we're America. We have certain responsibilities. And again, the president would have announced it, in essence, when it was over. So I think that would have, I think, uh, could have attained significant popularity. Um, I think you can appeal to the need to protect the country from terrorism because people recognize that's not a phony argument. There are terrorists out there all, all the time. We see these efforts being made, and some of them succeed. Um, the price and the tactics, I think, have to be discussed. 
if again, you know, if it's if it's a matter of sending expeditionary forces all over the place, you're going to have a very tough time. But if it's a matter of a bombing campaign, that's different. Or if it's a matter of saying, um, as the president is, well, he's doing it now. He isn't really saying much about it. Advisors. Um, <coughs> You know, if you're old enough to remember that 10,000 advisors became 500,000 troops in Vietnam, you're very old, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but most voters aren't going to remember that that started as an advisor. Um, I think one of the things a president, a new president, has to do is, is teach that not every involvement becomes the Vietnam War or uh, the, the uh, Iraq War, that there are there are many ways of getting of, of uh, projecting power. Um, we're using drones all the time now. People, don't, we may be using them too much, but people don't. The populace in general doesn't seem to object to that. Um, so I, I think yes, the president's going to have to figure out what what will the traffic bear. How much can I in my speeches change what the traffic will bear? Uh, how much of this, in fact, would be a strategy? That is, um, we may not be able to do everything we need to do now, but maybe we can do this, and then people will see, I'm a competent new president, we can project power without getting involved in another major war, and you can, you can build on that. Um, of course, you have to want to. But as I look at the, um, the, the Republicans, except for Rand Paul and Hillary Clinton, I think you know, they're not pacifists. In, in the category of sort of changing the equation, when you talk about projection of power, what about the possibility of setting up a Kurdish state, I don't mean as a part of Iraq, but an independent sovereign state for the Kurds, Lord knows they deserve it. In return for that, we put an American base in the new Kurdistan so that we have a stable platform for the projection of American power. It talks, uh, I think it speaks to giving support to an ally independent of the, you know, I think the Shiites versus the Sunnis. And we now have a place without declaring a war, we have a place where we can project not only American power, but stability in the region. This is good contrast with your earlier question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to learn and make progress. <laughs> That's why I come here. That's funny. I'm trying to be quicker than Obama. But. The, uh, well, the Kurds haven't asked for that. I mean, that's the striking thing. They, have, they do not believe, it would seem, that this is the moment to declare an independent Kurdistan. I don't believe that they, that that's because we've said no. That is, I don't believe they've come to us and said, we'll, we're ready to do it as soon as you're ready to back it. They want us to play Truman. You know, 11 minutes later, we um, recognize the new, the new country. They haven't asked for that. Um, so first, um, I think we need to let them make a decision in view of their estimate of relations with the Turks, with Iran, with Iraq. Um, when do they want to do it? Maybe it's soon. But you know, they've waited a long time. If it took another five years, fine. that's fine. They have you know, effective control of their, of their region. Now, if they were to come to us now and say, we think this is a good thing to do, I would hope we would support that. Um, whether we need a base there is a different question. I mean, um, we have a lot of bases, uh, air bases and naval bases in the immediate region. Um, we don't have big army bases where we have, you know, 25,000 guys. Um, and I don't know whether that would be um, a good idea. Um, I, I think that's a separate decision. But I, um, I'm, I'm inclined to the view that an independent Kurdistan would actually be helpful to the United States. Um, uh, in, in our relations with Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and others in the, in the region. Um, so I would hope if they, when they decide um, they're, they'd like to do it, um, 
we would back them. I mean, I used, it, when I was in the Reagan administration, the position of the United States with respect to Palestine was that we were opposed to the establishment of a Palestinian state. That was American policy for a very long time. You can look up, you know, speeches by George Shultz and others. Um, we basically wanted Jordan and Egypt to take some responsibility here. Um, and I used to say to people who, who, Europeans and others who were demanding a Palestinian state, why do they have the right to get a state? I mean, as opposed to, say, the Tibetans or the Kurds or the Basques or, you know, whoever is your favorite, um, the Inuit. Um, <laughs> so uh, there, are, there were a lot of claims of equal dignity, the Kurds being um, one, although putting aside world politics, I mean, nobody has a better claim than the Tibetans, I think. Um, now, of course, policy changed. Beginning under Clinton, then formally under Bush, we are for the Palestinian state, and one could easily see the policy evolving toward being strong proponents of there being a Kurdish state, which would be, I think, a good American ally, despite the fact that we have not been a very good ally to them. Yes. Andrew Rasmussen. Um, Saudi Arabia has money. Egypt has a big army. Uh, if the U.S. is out of it, what would happen if they organized and sent an Egyptian army to take over Syria and Iraq as the good guy Sunnis? <clears throat> so they'd have, to, they'd have to wipe out both sides. As you said, they don't want to look anti-Sunni. But uh, could those places resist? Well, um, when I took Kissinger's course, which is in, really is in medieval era, it was um, shortly before the 67 war. And <clears throat> uh, I remember um, a, a student asking about this one day. You know, what would happen if um, the Egyptians, this has been right before the war, if the Egyptians started moving. And, and I remember Kissinger saying, um, you know, the order will go out for the tanks and the jeeps to start moving but they won't be able to move because it will be found that the, the head of the motor pool at this base and that base sold all the gasoline <laughs> yesterday as he did every week when it came in because he wanted a better standard of living. Um, plus ça change. Um, look, uh, I was surprised um, a few months ago when ISIS, you know ISIS had been Hadn't, hadn't been fighting anybody who could fight. And then they came up against the Peshmerga. And I thought, and most of the people I talked to about this thought, okay, this is different. But it wasn't. The Peshmerga collapsed. Now, there are reasons for this. I mean, they hadn't fought in 10 years. We, the United States, had been remiss in not giving the Peshmerga the equipment. Peshmerga is the, the Kurdish, the Kurdish, Kurdish army. Kurdish. Um, we, we had, we had uh, been remiss in not giving them, because we said everything must go through Baghdad, which was stopping it. Um, so they weren't well equipped and they hadn't fought since Saddam Hussein days. Um, maybe they'll come back. Maybe, I think they have largely come back, but, but they were really defeated by ISIS. That's the Peshmerga, which was a good fighting force 10 years ago. Egyptian army, I'm very dubious. I, you know, so far what they've done is they've sent uh, warships off the coast, which is a good thing to do. Uh, they may or may not, I, I think they're participating in the air as well. Mostly it's the Saudis and Emiratis. But if I were Sisi, I'd worry a lot. Because what happens if you send an Egyptian expeditionary force, start with Yemen, and they perform really badly, and hundreds and hundreds of men are killed? Um, and, and, you know, this is the internet age, so you're not going to be able to keep that all secret. It's, uh, you know, and Al Jazeera and others show it. Um, this could be destabilizing for the regime in Egypt. So. Um, I, um, I, I think that's the fallacy that the Egyptian army could actually, I think, that the Egyptian army could actually do this kind of vast military activity. It is large, um, but what, you know, it hasn't fought in a very long time. Where, yeah, yeah, but, but that's a long time ago, and what they're doing now, I mean, remember also what, what um, I mean, they're active in the Sinai, but remember, the Israelis in the 2006 war in Lebanon didn't do as well as they'd expected, partly because they'd been used to fighting in the West Bank, fighting individual terrorists 
little groups. Hadn't really fought a war in a while. Um, I fear that would be the outcome. Now, I, I um, uh, clearly this is not, I, I think, um, th this idea of an Arab force is not a joke. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting together to do some more in Yemen. We know the Emiratis, for example, bombed Libya, uh, which is reasonably far away. Um, and I think you'll see more of that because they don't, they've got the money. In the case of uh, certainly, well, the Egyptians too, but Saudis and Emirati, they've got lots of equipment that they've bought from us and the Europeans. Um, the Emiratis have been, they have very good special forces. So um, I think they really will be more involved uh, in Yemen. I think they're not prepared to see Iran basically take over Yemen. But the idea of, of and, they, and they want Egypt to be involved. But it's interesting, you know, this very week, the, the Pakistani parliament said no. They would not send troops to join this force uh, and fight in Yemen. Very interesting. Um, so I, I just don't think this is re realistic. <clears throat> If I can follow up on that with a second question. I, uh, given what you've written, I'm thinking of this piece you wrote, and I think you wrote others in, in the summer of 2013, <coughs> where you clearly were not very supportive, at least as I read it, of the al-Sisi regime and pretty critical of Obama for not ending sanctions, um, for not invoking yep, sanctions. Yep. Um, <coughs> unless your position has changed, and that's fine. But given the question you were asked, I'd like to hear you reflect on why um, a regime like al-Sisi would help us, maybe maybe it would have some, it would, it would, it would meet the Iranian challenge, but <clears throat> it wouldn't really address the Islamist challenge, would it? And it would arguably inflame it. Yeah. Um, I didn't know people were allowed to read previous uh, writings of mine. It's very uh, unfair and uh, shouldn't be permitted. Uh, um, but on this one, anyway, my view has not changed. Um, I'm not in the CC fan club, and it's a very big fan club nowadays. Um, I'm not because I just think that the domestic policy is repression, period. And that'll work for a while. Um, but I don't think it's a formula for stability in Egypt. There is no politics in Egypt now, and I just don't think that's gonna work. Um, if, you know, I can't read his mind, if, if he views this as a transition period, and his plan is to stabilize things for 2015, and then you'll see by the end of the year a real expansion of political life, fine. I just don't, I don't think that's right. Um, and I think, um, the, the uh, you know, as I said before, I mean, we kissed up to Mubarak and then the army and then Morsi and now Sisi, and none of them were stable in the end. So I don't, I just don't think it, it, it will, um, it will work. I, now he has made a speech, one good speech, about reform in Islam. Uh, yes. Um, now, I mean, uh, he's not really an authority on Islam, you know, and I don't think too many, I don't, I don't know how much weight that carries. Some weight, because he is president, but, um, and he was elected, but, but uh, not, not a lot, I think, in this battle. And I worry, um, I do think that one of the things we need to do with respect to ISIS, as I said before, is defeat it militarily. I really do believe that. And, and Egypt can be helpful in this. Maybe. Um, I mean, it can be helpful in the Sinai. Sinai is theirs. Mm. They're fighting. We should be helping them win that fight in Sinai. We don't want to see, we don't want to see the Sinai become ungoverned territory and more terrorist activity than there is now. Um, on, the, on the ideological side, I don't think he's going to be very helpful. Uh, because what does he represent? He represents the army. What's your Syria policy? You spoke at this as the central yeah. um, failed state in part and the recruit, the, one of the main causes yeah. of jihad. I'm afraid my Syria policy um, is the same policy um, as it would have been a couple of years ago, 
which is a combination of, of um, creating, supporting or creating um, a Syrian rebel force that is non-jihadi, and um, when the need arises or the opportunity arises, doing a little American military air action. Um, uh, I don't think Assad should be permitted to use chlorine gas and barrel bombs against the population of Syria. Um, and I think we should punish him and prevent him uh, from doing that. Um, now, there are a number of people, uh, Robert Ford, the former ambassador, um, says, and it's, it's too late, it's just too late. It was the right policy to create a Syrian rebel force, uh, but it's too late to do that. Um, he knows more about Syria than I do, but I don't agree. Um, the CIA says it's too late. I don't, uh, of course, I'm out now, so I don't read the CIA stuff, but I don't believe it anyway, because they um, have a tendency to tell the, most presidents what the presidents want to hear. And they know what the president wants to hear, that you can't do this, it's too late to do this. So that's what they're telling him. Um, um, some of the people who are fighting, some of the people who are fighting for al-Nusra or even Islamic State um, are Sunnis who are fighting against this murderous, vicious regime. Why are they fighting in these groups and not those groups? We didn't give the rebel groups anything. We didn't give them any money. We didn't give them any guns. So if you're a uh, young man and you want to fight, um, these people have wooden, uh, fake wooden rifles to give you, and those people have a real fighting force and a salary for you. Well, where are you going to end up? Um, so I, think, I do not think it's too late. I think if the United States got into this and said, we have a new policy, and we're going to create these groups, and we want your help, Turkey, and we want your help, Jordan, we want your help, Saudis, um, but this is a serious effort now. I think it is not too late, and that would be my policy. Um, now, whether you can, you know, where does that lead? Could you put the old Syria back together again? It may be, may be too late for that. And maybe you'll have a confederal Syria at best. Um, but that's what I would do. One more can of worms. Question here. This is a follow-up on Syria and also on Egypt. I mean, isn't it possible, though, to simply look at these states in an economic way and say that they're failed states? It seems that in Syria, their agricultural situation, their water table, it's kind of, it, it doesn't seem like it can be revived. Even, even if it was a run state, it seems like it's an economic freefall. It would be dependent on Iran permanently. And in Egypt, they're already completely dependent on Saudi Arabian money and largesse. And in Egypt, again, I can geek you could point to, without even looking into the Islamic issue, they import, they're like a banana republic without bananas, they import the majority. I think they would import 50% of their grain or some 60%, which is extremely dangerous for them. They have food shortages and riots, and uh, they have a highly illiterate population of 40% on $2 a day. And they just look to me like failed states, um, over, leaving aside the entire Middle East issue. They, it just, they look like failed states from a, just a straightforward point of view, and so I wonder whether, you know, whether we should no. treat them as such and therefore yeah. kind of contain them, but they contain the fallout of their failure. But, uh, well, there were, I think, I mean, you have a point, but I think it's overstated. Um, prior to the war, Syria was not a failed state. I mean, no one was giving Syria billions and billions of dollars in economic aid. We weren't, the EU wasn't, the Gulfies weren't, Iran wasn't. Um, it was getting along, you know. Um, they had some exports, not a hell of a lot, but it was not a failed economy. People were not starving. Um, Egypt, again, go back to Egypt uh, in 2010. Uh, no picnic, but they weren't getting $10 billion a year from the Gulf. They weren't getting much from us, a few hundred million in economic aid uh, in Europe. So it was, um, it, it was, it was... The food prices have gone up. Yes, and one, one can argue this is a contributing factor in actually the instability that led to the overthrow of, um, of Mubarak. Uh, but uh, here we come back to why I think Sisi thus far hasn't earned you know, a heroic stature. One, it isn't impossible to grow food and cotton and other things in Egypt. Um, there isn't any reason why they are in a situation where they're only growing half the food they need. And 
he would really be a heroic figure if he could figure out a way to address that. Um, he's compared sometimes to Pinochet, um, the general who will make all these changes. Uh, but Pinochet did make all those economic changes and produced an economic miracle that is carrying Chile to this day in prosperity. Uh, I love it if Sisi would, would do that. He's done a couple of things. You know, he's lowered some of the subsidies significantly, but it isn't a real transformation. I, th I think it just overstates it to say that, now, Syria, huge damage from the war, so we'll see what emerges if and when the fighting stops. But I wouldn't call them failed states. I'd call them uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, call a poor country. Martha. Um, you explained... Um, the administration seeming solicitude for Iran in terms of Western guilt. Um, what about the, uh, the, the seeming antipathy toward Israel, um, certainly toward Netanyahu, but maybe even Israel? How would you explain that? Or, or am I, um, is that a bridge too far to say the antipathy to Netanyahu extends to Israel? Well, I, I think they're different. I mean, the, the, there is a personal problem here. Uh, between Netanyahu and the president. It happens from time to time. This is a particularly bitter one, but I, mean, I remember Bush and Chirac. Bush and Schroeder didn't get along. What is striking, though, is that when they didn't get along, it was obvious that we needed to have relations at, at a very high level as allies, so we worked around. Um, in, in the, just as an example, in the case of France, um, the French National Security Advisor came to the White House once a month. And this was in the second term. Um, Connie would come over from the State Department, Steve Hadley, and I and uh, a couple of others, and we, we'd meet in the National Security Advisor's office, and we would do our business because we wanted Franco-American relations to be terrific, even though the top guys didn't like each other, didn't get along. Um, it worked. That's not happening. So uh, why not? Well. Again, some of this, you know, Israel's had a right of center government for 15 years. This combination of, you know, uh, uh, Republicans and Labor Party, Democrats and Likud, it's not ideal. But I think there's something, I really do think there's something deeper. I mean, the president's June 2009 Cairo speech showed a lack of understanding of Israel. He was there. He didn't go to Israel. He attributed the existence of Israel to the Holocaust. Period, such that when he went there in 2013, he had, in a sense, to make a point of saying, Israel is the product of generations and hundreds of years of longing. Um, so I don't think he gets Israel. Um, and some of the things he said more recently, too, I think, I think um, he doesn't understand them politically, he doesn't understand them psychologically. Um, I'm reminded of his comments at the, I guess it was going away party for Rashid Khalidi, you know, that he learned so much from Rashid Khalidi. I think this fits into his view of the world. Amy. Yeah, I'm curious about your view of Turkey and our relationship with Erdogan. Is, what, why isn't Turkey a bigger actor in this region, and is that, has that always been the case, or is, is this a... I'll try to answer. I'm not, you know, I'm no, no Turkey expert. Um, Erdogan um, succeeded in a kind of economic miracle for Turkey. I mean, the, the growth rate was extraordinary, which is why he became so popular. Um, but um, it went to their heads, and if you go back Oh, 2000, let's say five years ago, more or less. Um, you can find articles in the newspapers, The Economist and so forth, about the new Ottomans. They really thought with this economic expansion, Turkey was going to take its place again as the center, not only of the Middle East, but of the former, the Turkic, the Turkic language area. Um, and it was a great exaggeration of their diplomatic ability and their political ability. And it, and it hasn't worked. Um, just as an example, Syria. I mean, they have, they have had a more serious, obviously it's on the border, they're, they've got a million refugees, um, and they have wanted to overthrow Assad. And I think they thought they could do it, but they couldn't do it, not without us. And we, were not, we weren't willing to get involved in it. So it failed. 
you know, they had a policy of, um, he called it, no problems with any of the neighbors. They have problems with every single neighbor now. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a failed foreign policy. Simultaneously, I think uh, more and more um, compromise of, of human rights and democracy internally. Um, it, it was the army first. Well, that's fine. I mean, getting away from coups. But then it was the, the judiciary, and then it was the media. And um, so it's now, I think, uh, quite a bad situation. So that, that we are unable to cooperate more closely, particularly because Erdogan, Erdogan's anti-Israel, and I would argue anti-Semitic um, statements, uh, are also a problem um, for the United States. Um, that, I think, explains why their policy is not successful and we can't cooperate as much as we might like with them. I don't know how long this lasts. I mean, people thought at one point, you know, he would alternate with Ghul, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Now, maybe he's going to, maybe he will now be able to change it to the kind of presidential system he wants, and then he can be De Gaulle or Putin or whatever model he has in mind. But... Um, Part of the problem is the opposition has not been uh, as well organized and competent as I think one would, the, the CHP, the Republican Party, as one would, as one would have hoped. Uh, and again, he's riding the crest of his great economic advancement. So I don't, in the short run, meaning you know the next few years, I don't see much changing there. Elliot, this has been the definition of informed comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.